Okay, maybe we can slowly yeah. start. Fine with me. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have you here, and also our guests, Matthias and Steven from AI Minify. Uh, is its name implies. So basically, they are working on um, minification of AI models. So we will hear um, more in detail about their their work and also the techniques that are used for the, for that purpose. Um, this is the first big geodata talk we organized after a very long time, and in fact, it's the first physical one that we organized. So we are really excited to to have you also for that purpose. Um, uh, AI Minify is actually linked to uh, another company which is called uh, Tinify, um, which maybe you heard about it because there are two famous websites which are TinyPNG and TinyJPEG, which are very common. We are actually regularly using it to compress uh, the newsletters that you are receiving. And actually, Matthias is running uh, that company. So. Um, so it's not only the minification of, of the AI models, but in fact, minification of images and a similar, similar data, we can say. So maybe uh, we can learn about them as well. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank nice. you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, nice. Thank you for joining. Um, we have never been so popular, so this is nice. Uh, <laughs> or at least I haven't been so popular, no, sorry, either. I won't talk for you. But, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so my name is uh, Matthijs Plat. Uh, I'm the founder of AI Minify, and it's Steven. He can actually do something, so he's an AI engineer. Um, our goal of today is to learn about smart ways to compress neural networks. Um, I will shortly uh, introduce ourselves and the company, and then Steven will do all the technical uh, details. Um, you already mentioned we are a spin-off from Tinyfy, tinypng.com. So uh, uh, Tinypng is there for like 10 years now, uh, compressing images. Some of you heard of it, uh, I understood. Um, focusing on making it easy for the user. Just give the image to us, drag and drop, or API, and no settings, you will get the best result. Running uh, Tinyfy, we were thinking about, hey, what are other things that we can do to innovate? Uh, we have spent some time on compressing uh, DICOM uh, images, so the medical images. That was not a success. Uh, and last year we started uh, compressing the, the neural networks. Um, and what you see is that we have the same approach. So we want to compress without any settings because we want to make it easy. Um, at this moment, I think people who built the AI networks, uh, they are very technical, but in the near future, I think my mother could be able to build a network because things will be more easy. That's, I think, the way we will go. Um, so we want to automate that pipeline to make it very easy to make it uh, without any settings. And as we come from the images with Tinyfy, we started with focusing on uh, the computer vision. So that's where we are now with the, with the company. Um, and then we go to the technical part, so uh, that's for you. <laughs> yes, so um, I'm Steven. I uh, studied AI in uh, Utrecht, both my bachelor and my master's. Uh, and now I'm working for Matthijs. Uh, so I don't know a lot about uh, geoanalytics, so I won't talk about that a lot. But I hope you can understand that if you uh, use this in your neural networks that you use for geoanalytics, that it can uh, speed up the process a lot. Um, yeah, so first I'm going to talk a bit about just the basics of neural networks because if you don't understand the basics, um, uh, I think that some of you don't really know a lot about neural networks. Uh, and if you don't understand the basics, then you can't understand the, the compression tools either. Um, yeah, so neural networks, the, the two basic um, formats are the, the dense neural network and the convolutional, net, convolutional neural network. So you have a lot of other stuff uh, nowadays there are more complicated things, but these are like the, the basics. Um, yeah, so a dense neural network is uh, uh, a neural network that has a one-dimensional input. So you can put in a number or a list of numbers, and from that you can get uh, either some absolute numbers, so if you can estimate the price of a car based on some features of that car, uh, or you can get a percentage, so you can like estimate the odds of someone having a disease based on uh, some blood values and the age of a person and some other stuff. Uh, and then you have a convolutional neural network and it works kind of the same, only it takes a two-dimensional input, so usually that's an image. 
Uh, and that's what we are most interested in as AI Minified because we do uh, computer vision networks. Um, and from a CNN you can get also an absolute number. So if you do something really scary like uh, estimate someone's age based on an image of their face, uh, a bit tricky maybe. But, uh, and you can do a percentage. So what are the odds that this image is a dog or a cat or a fish or whatever? Or you can turn an image into another image. So, for example, you've probably seen like turn some image into a, a Van Gogh style image. Okay, so the very basics of neural networks uh, look something like this. So you have a, a, a dense neural network here, and you have an input layer, a hidden layer. Usually there are multiple hidden layers, and then an output layer. So in the input layer, you can see uh, the number of input nodes. So, for example, in the if you estimate if someone has a certain disease, you have a certain amount of input, so the age, the height of a person, the blood values, whatever else, and that number of input uh, nodes you have. And then you have a bunch of hidden layers, and there all the difficult math uh, is done, and then uh, in the end you get an output layer and that says yes or no, or something like that. Um, so all these nodes in a dense neural network are connected to each other, so each layer is connected fully to the next layer, um, and each of these connections has a certain weight. So what the, the network does is it calculates all this stuff and then it multiplies the values in this node by the weights and then it gets into this node. Um, and then inside the node there's an activation function. Um, so here you can see that you get the inputs and you multiply them by the weights and then inside the node you add a bias and then you get all that together, so all these inputs together and you put them into some activation function. We'll see on the next slide how what an activation function looks like. And then you get an output, and then it gets to the next node again. Um, so activation functions look something like this. So you have a lot of different stuff, but basically what it does is it just maps all these, um, these values that you get in uh, to the node. It maps that to a certain number. So for example, very similar one is the linear activation function, so that just does nothing, it linearly uh, yeah, just maps the, the, the number to the same number. But you also have like a, the ReLU that uh, maps numbers below zero just to zero and above zero, it keeps the, the number the same. And like that you have a lot of other activation functions. So to summarize, in a neuron, you take the input, you multiply it by the weights, you add a bias, then you feed the result to the activation function, and then you take the output of the activation function and you transmit it to the, to the next neuron. Okay, so how does a network learn the weights and bias? So you don't set those weights and biases uh, up front, but your network learns them some way. So the keyword there is uh, backpropagation. Um, your network does start with some basic weights and biases, otherwise it wouldn't work. And there are lots of ways you can uh, initialize these weights and biases, but that's not really important right now. Uh, usually you do it some kind of random way. Um, but what you do is you propagate your training data through your network, and then you get an expected output, so we call that Y, and, uh, and a real output, that's Y hat. So from your training data, you already know what the real output is going to be, so that's the Y hat, and you get some output from your network. And then you can use a loss function, so like the one here, um, to calculate your loss. So a very simple one is this, the mean squared error, so you just take the error, so the expected output minus the real output, or the real output minus the expected output, and then you square that and you take the mean over all your training data. And then what you do with that loss is you uh, give that back to the previous layer of nodes and that propagates back all the way to the start of your network. And you do that with something called the, the chain rule of calculus. It's a bit too mathematic to get uh, all into that in a short time that we have. Um, but that way your network can slowly learn um, how to adapt to make your loss as minimal as possible. Um, the speed of this adaption uh, of the weights can be determined by a learning rate and you apply your learning rate to an optimization algorithm um, and with those two you can determine how fast your network is going to converge. Um, you don't want it to happen too fast because then um, you probably are going to rely more on some outliers. So for example if there's a few uh, images in your training data that are very specific uh, features, you don't want to overfit your, your network on that. 
So you want to train very slow in order to make sure that you yeah, focus on the right aspects, right features. Um, so yeah, you pull your training data a few times through your network, and those times are called epochs, and then at some point you say, okay, my loss is minimal now, and then hopefully your network uh, works. So that's the very basic basics. And then for CNN, so the convolutional neural networks, there's not that much different, except for that there's two-dimensional data, and there's a lot of different layers that you have. So in the dense neural network, you only have the nodes that are connected to the, the next layer of nodes. Um, but in CNNs, you have some different layers, like convolutional layers, that's what it's called after. It's a convolutional neural network. Uh, also pooling layers, flattening layers, and a lot of other stuff that uh, I won't be discussing today. Um, but the convolutional layers are important to get for uh, the compression because this is where we do um, a part of our compression. Um, so for the convolutional layers, you slide a filter. So this one is the filter. You slide it over your input image. Um, and what you can decide is your filter size. So the size of this thing here, it's three by three. You can decide the stride or the step size. So you can either do one step at a time. So then the next uh, filter would be like starting at the four. But you can also say, okay, let's do two steps at a time or three steps at a time. And um, what that does is that determines, if you think logically, you can see that that determines the size of your output matrix. Um, you can decide the padding. So um, for example, now if we would stride our filter over this uh, image, then the nine would only be counted once because if we, go further, uh, then it doesn't see, the filter doesn't see the nine anymore, but the one would count three times. So sometimes what people would do is they add another uh, row and column of numbers to your image so that the nine actually gets counted multiple times. Uh, and one of the most important things that you can decide is the amount of filters. So now there's only one filter which leads to one output array, but if you have more filters, then you um, also get more output array, so you turn your 2D image into something 3D. Um, yeah, so all these parameters influence the size of your output matrix in some way. Uh, yes. Okay, so that's the basics about a convolutional layer. And then you have a pooling layer, so a pooling layer is used to prevent overfitting. Um, it generalizes the input of your, of your uh, neural network. Um, so what you can do is, for example, here you can see uh, max pooling, so it just takes out of that, uh, that part of the network. So you have a, this is a two by two pooling uh, kernel. So out of the two by two block, it takes the maximum number and it just uh, yeah forwards that. Um, your pooling layer is two parameters, so your filter size and the, again the stride or the step size. Um, and the important thing is that there are many different pooling layers, so you have minimal, maximum, average, and whatever else you can think of. Um, and the nice thing about pooling layers is that it shrinks your matrix, but it doesn't add in the third dimension. Uh, so it actually just makes things a bit smaller. Uh, and in the end, you want things to be smaller because you want to end usually with a flattening layer. And the, yeah, the flattening layer is very straightforward. It just flattens your, uh, your image. So it turns the two-dimensional image into a one-dimensional image. And the nice thing about flattening layers is that after a flattening layer, you can use your dense layers again. Um, so this is what a complete CNN looks like. Um, and what you can see here, so you have your input image and then you do some convolutional layers and some pooling to make it smaller and another convolutional layer, another pooling. And what it does there is feature extraction. So you try to extract all the features from your image and then once you have enough features, or you think you have enough features, you do a flattening layer, and then um, you have a part that's uh, the dense neural network, or fully connected layers, and there you can do your classification. So from all those features, you can actually try to tell something about the image. So this one says 70% zebra. Okay, so now on to the more interesting part for us. So that's the compression. Uh, what we do in uh, AI Minify is mostly quantization pruning. Some other stuff that I'm not going to be talking about today because it's not very interesting, but it does help a bit. Uh, and what we're interested in is knowledge distillation. Um, but because we want to create an 
automated pipeline, so people just put in their neural network and get uh, a compressed neural network out of it. Uh, we haven't been able to, to perform noise distillation well because it leads to a lot of uh, human inputs. Okay, so first, uh, quantization. So what we do in quantization is we can change the weights and the biases and the activations from 32-bit floats to, for example, 16-bit floats or 8-bit integers. Um, what this does is it's mostly a storage saver. So uh, in quantization, for example, if we would go from 32 bits to 8 bits, you can save 75% of storage. So just if you have a model of one gigabytes, then suddenly it, you can shrink it to 250 megabytes. Um, but it can also increase speed in some cases. Uh, but that's highly depending on hardware. Um, so not all CPUs or probably no CPUs can uh, run a 16-bit float model well. Some GPUs can, but it's all very, uh, yeah, hardware dependent. And of course, it can also cause accuracy loss. So you can understand that if you go from 32-bit float, so that's an, uh, a number with a lot of numbers after the decimal point. If you go to an 8-bit integer, so that's like, a, what is it, 0 to 256. Yeah, then, then you lose a lot of information. But the thing is that if your network is big enough, then uh, yeah, what all the research shows is that you can easily get rid of a lot of this information because other parts of the network will, um, yeah, will, how you say, will, will make it better again. Compass. Yeah, that's exactly the word <laughs> I was looking for. <laughs> Okay, so a bit of math about quantization. Um, so your basic int 8 quantization does uh, yeah, mapping all your weights to yeah, either minus 128 to 127 or 0 to 265, it's uh, 256. That's a bit dependent on if you use a signed or an unsigned integer, and it yeah, can uh, both happen. Um, but what you do is you find the, the scale S, so um, you do that by taking the, the max of your weights minus the, the, the minimum of your weights, and you divide it by the 265, because that's the, the range you're gonna get in. Uh, and then you get your scale. Um, and then you find your 0 0.z, and you do that by taking the, the minus of the minimal of your weights divided by that scale. So what you basically do is you try to um, find a center in all your weights, and you try to see what the distribution looks like, and then you can map all the values of those weights to integers. So for example, if your weights start at minus, uh, minus 100 and they, they end at plus 100, then you can map the minus 100 to the minimum, so to minus 128, and you can map the, the 100 to the 127. And um, so what's nice here is that it keeps in mind that um, Nah, that's it. So what it does is it just maps numbers uh, with a decimal point to like integers. So that's a really nice thing. So you can uh, lower your range a bit. Uh, and then finally, you can obviously quantize by um, by taking your weight, dividing it by the scale, adding the the z, and rounding it. Uh, so in AMINIFY, we we quantize TensorFlow and PyTorch models. Um, both these frameworks yeah, are very well known in the neural network uh, world uh, and they both offer quantization in their own way. So for TensorFlow they call it uh, dynamic range quantization, but it's basically the same as PyTorch dynamic quantization. And for TensorFlow they say full integer quantization, but that's the same as PyTorch static quantization. And TensorFlow also offers uh, float 16 quantization. So we'll quick, quickly uh, go over those. Um, so dynamic quantization is one of the easiest forms of quantization. So what it does is it quantizes your 32-bit floats. So all models are usually in 32-bit floats. And it quantizes those to 8-bit integers. Um, and what it does is it converts your activations uh, to 8-bit integers dynamically. So that's why it's called dynamic quantization. So you can do the quantization of the weights. Um, you can do that before. But the quantization of your activations actually happens inside the network while you're running it. Um, 
So the downside of that is that activations are both read and written to your memory in a 32-bit float format, which makes it easier for your computer, but also makes it a bit slower because it has to do some conversions. Um, yeah, so this, like I said, it saves a lot of space, so 75%. Um, but because of that reading and writing that constantly has to happen, it only improves the latency a bit. Um, so maybe I forgot to mention it, but the activations are actually the, the numbers that come out of your activation function. So every time some value propagates from one layer to the next layer, uh, that value is called an activation. Uh, and that value has to be converted from 32-bit float to 8-bit integer during your inference time uh, uh, so that you can do your 8-bit uh, int uh, matrix multiplication. So that's dynamic quantization. And then you have full integer quantization or static quantization. So there what you do is you quantize not only your weights, but also your biases and activations and everything in your model beforehand. Um, but as you can maybe see, what you need for that is some way to determine what your uh, activations are going to look like. So um, quantizing your weights is easy because you know the weights already in a network. You know the, whole, the weights of the whole network after you train it. So you can just quantize those. You, you know the range of the weights. Um, but quantizing your activations is not as easy because um, you don't know what type of data is coming into your network until you actually use it. Um, so what they do with full integer quantization in TensorFlow or static quantization in PyTorch is um, they use small data sets, so like 100 to 500 samples. Uh, and from the data set, they can see, they can remember um, what your activations look like during your network. And then they can actually quantize it in a smart way, because otherwise, um, let's take a very simple example. If you, your data uh, has a range of, let's say, 0 to 100, but the, the, the quantization actually expects your data to have a range of minus 500 to 500, then you lose a lot of, um, of uh, precision. So if you do this, you first put in some re representative data, then, then your network can actually see, oh, your data is only between the range of 0 and 100. And then it can uh, focus much more precision on that part. Um, so then you have float 16 quantization. So only TensorFlow does that. Um, <coughs> Well, basically, it's very simple what it does. It, it quantizes your, your float 32 uh, numbers to float 16. So that halves your model size. So instead of the 75% you save with 8-bit integers, you save 50%. Um, but the tricky thing about this is that it doesn't really improve your speed on CPU. So like I said, uh, most CPUs can't handle 16-bit um, uh, floats. Um, so internally, all your weights and, and biases and activations have to be dequantized again to 32 bits because the CPU can't work with 16 bit. Um, and then dequantized, then does the calculations, then quantized to 16 bits again, and then for the next layer again and again. And this takes yeah a lot of time. So uh, this doesn't improve your speed, but probably also makes it a bit slower. Um, but on a GPU that is specialized in doing float uh, 16s, there it does improve your speed a lot because yeah, you have numbers that uh, have half of the bits. Um, but like I said, so this is very hardware specific. So some GPUs can handle it and you need to be sure that your GPU can handle it if you want to do this because otherwise it makes no sense at all. Okay, so that's about quantization. Then another thing we do is uh, pruning. So Pruning basically is just removing unnecessary parts of your network. So in AI Minify, we have various pruning techniques um, depending on what input network you do. So we try to detect what kind of pruning is good for the network that we uh, get into the algorithm. Um, and besides, so what most um, pruning techniques do in that we read from a, a bunch of papers and stuff is that they look at the complete network. So for example, they say, okay, this is a big network, so we can try to prune 35, 40% of the network. And then 
per layer, they actually prune that 40%. But what we found out is that, well, I mean, it's quite obvious that in the last couple of layers of your network where you actually um, take all the features and you try to, uh, yeah, to make something, something out of it, um, those nodes are far more important. So if you prune 40% of those nodes, then probably you're going to hurt your accuracy a lot. Um, so what we're trying to do is try to focus per layer, see how important it is, and then based on that, we determine how hard to prune. Okay, so for pruning in dense neural networks, the, the theory is quite simple. So what you want to do is you want to remove either nodes or synapses, so the connections between nodes that are not important. Um, but there are a bunch of difficulties. So how do you know what nodes are unimportant? And um, if you have a sparse network, so if you just remove synapses but keep all the nodes, then it's pretty hard for both CPUs and GPUs to actually calculate with that because they want whole matrices to, to do a multi multiplication. So if you remove some part of a matrix, yeah, then basically what you're going to do is just input zeros and you don't save any time at all because it still has to do all the, the calculations. Um, and when you, for example, remove one node, it also impacts the next node because the next node expects a certain amount of inputs um, and it doesn't get that anymore. So that will ruin your whole network. So there are a lot of stuff to, to think about. Um, so now some of the answers. So what nodes or synapses are unimportant? So intuitively you could say that synapses with a weight close to zero are less important to the network because if you do a multiplication and you do a multiplication with something that's close to zero, probably what's gonna come out of it is close to zero again. Um, and that way, yeah, you don't impact the network a lot. So you can understand that bigger numbers impact your network more than smaller numbers. Um, but yeah, if we prune synapses only, then we create the sparse network, which is very hard for our CPUs and GPUs. So that's not what we want to do. What we want to do is prune whole nodes. Um, and what we do is then we calculate the magnitude of a node. Um, so the magnitude of a node is simply we take all their incoming weights and we take the, uh, yeah, how would you say that? You take the square root of those squared. So basically the Euclidean distance. I hope you know what it means. Uh, you take that and then you can calculate the magnitude of that node. So how important that node is to the rest of the network. And then basically you can just say, okay, if we want to prune 20% of this layer, then we just prune the 20% of nodes with the lowest magnitude. So with the lowest L2 node. Okay, then pruning in convolutional neural networks. Um, so this kind of works the same. Um, so what we want to do is we want to prune again the weights from a filter. So that's similar to that we want to prune the synapses and not the nodes. But again, we can't really do that because yeah, CPUs and GPUs have a hard time to not do matrix con uh, uh, multiplications. So if we prune, for example, here's a filter, and if we would just take out these zeros here, yeah, then the, the computer won't know how to do the multiplication anymore, so you will keep the zeros in there. So what we want to do is we want to prune whole filters, just like we want to prune whole neurons. Um, and by pruning whole filters, so um, like I said before, you can have multiple filters, so in this image you only have one, sadly, but uh, if you have like a row of filters here, so usually you have like 32 filters or 64 filters, something like that. If we just prune a, a little bit of that, then we save a lot of time in calculations because yeah, you just have to do less multiplications, um, which increases speed. So how do we determine what filters to prune? Um, I guess it makes sense to do it similar to in dense neural networks, so to remove the filters with the smallest norm. But there are some, um, there's like a, a recent paper, so no, recent from 2019, that mentioned that, okay, that this only works well if there are two criteria that are being met, and that's if the norm deviation of the filters is large. So if there's a lot of different norms, so the, if the range is big, uh, then this makes sense. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to find a good threshold. So if, um, if all your norms are centered 
really closely around one number, then how are you going to determine the threshold to prune? Um, so if you prune 40%, for example, yeah, then you, you are basically just randomly taking some filters away without... Um, well, they're also really centered uh, close to the middle. I hope this kind of makes sense. It's a bit hard to understand, to uh, explain. Um, and the other criteria is that the minimum norm of the filter should be small. So if the minimum norm is not small, then you're still pruning away a filter that might have a lot of impact on your neural network. Uh, and obviously these criteria are not always met. Uh, so we have to do something smarter than just finding this, uh, the L2 norm. Uh, that's filter pruning via geometric median. So this is, uh, like I said, from a paper in 2019. Um, so what they thought of is instead of pruning the filters with the lowest norm, they prune the filters that are most common. Um, because what if a small norm still has some very critical influence on your network? Um, so what they do is, in, the, in this image you can see it quite clearly, um, you have your filter space, so here you can see some filters with a large norm, some with a medium, some with a small norm, and usually what previous methods did, so just the filter pruning on, on the norm, they just kept the large norm and they removed the medium and the small norm. Uh, but now what these people thought of is, yeah, uh, probably this large norm quite, kind of does the same as these other two that are very close around it. Um, so what I thought of is, instead of that, we, re we remove just a filter that is more common. So that's this one. And we keep the, the medium norm that is on a whole different scale. Um, yeah, and what they found is that their, their results were actually a lot better than, uh, than the basic magnitude uh, pruning. Uh, so that's really nice. So this is one of the, the pruning uh, algorithms that we also use in uh, AM Unify. Okay, and then finally, um, so we have knowledge installation. So for the pruning and the quantization, um, we can do it all automatically. So when you give us your network, we can detect what, what kind of network it is and see what kind of pruning and what kind of quantization we can uh, apply to it. So it's also based on if we get a training set uh, with the network. So if we get a training set, then we can do the static quantization and otherwise we have to do the dynamic one, etc. But for the knowledge distillation, um, yeah, you need a lot of human input, so we haven't uh, implemented that into the AI Minify algorithm yet. Um, but because it has very good results, uh, I did want to talk about it, and we're also still very interested in trying to see if we can get a way to make it uh, automatic. Um, yeah, but it's difficult. So what knowledge distillation does, it's, it's also called the teacher-student model. Um, it uses the original model, so the original model is called the teacher model, to train a smaller model, and that's called the student. So your original model, maybe it outputs something like, um, this image is 86% dog, 1% cat, 5% fish, 8% something else, a bird. Um, and then, because we have these soft labels, so usually your training data only says, okay, this image is a dog, that's it. But because we have these soft labels from the original model, so we know that this image is also kind of similar to a cat, but it's probably a dog, uh, we can train your smaller neural network in a much more precise way. Um, so what this does is it uses the soft labels, so not only the hard label that actually determines, okay, this is probably a dog, but also the labels that say maybe it's a cat and probably not a fish. Uh, it uses those labels to train the student uh, yeah, in a different way. Uh, so what you can see is here in this very nice image. Um, so you have your teacher model, and you use a softmax activation. So a softmax activation uh, ensures that all your odds add up to 100%. Um, and then you can use these soft labels to train your student model. So here you can see that that's called the distillation loss. So you take all the uh, soft predictions from the student model. So the student model also says when it's predicting something, okay, this is 80% dog, 50% cat, whatever. Uh, and then you can use the soft labels from the original teacher model to say, okay, that is right or wrong, or you have to adjust in this kind of way. And 
At the same time, you also train the student model to use the actual hard labels, so the labels from your training data, which you say, this is a dog, end of it. And then by using those two um, inputs, instead of just the one input, you can actually train your model. Um, you can have a, large, a much smaller model to be trained in kind of the exact same way as the, as the big model. So a very famous uh, example of that is uh, Distill Bird. Uh, so Bird is one of the predecessors of JetGPT, so something that can predict uh, words in a sentence. Um, and the researchers that used the knowledge installation on Distill Bird uh, actually managed to reduce the size of Bird by 40%. So that's quite a lot for such a large model. Uh, and they retrained it to 97% uh, accuracy. Um, so only a 3% loss compared to the original model. And it made the model 60% faster. So yeah, you can understand why we are very interested in it because yeah, if we can do this automatically for a lot of networks, then um, yeah, that would be great. Um, that was it for the technical part. So I hope that you can understand that this was not really a geo talk, but um, for example, if you use your neural networks to detect solar panels or trees from uh, uh, air imagery. I'm not sure how to call it in the professional way. <laughs> Everybody gets it. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you use that, then maybe it takes like a week or something to do it for the whole of the Netherlands. But if you can actually speed up your network by 50%, it suddenly only takes three and a half days. So that's, uh, yeah, a big speed increase is something that's uh, probably really nice. was a very important informative presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, we can have some questions from the audience. We have about 20 minutes for this. Yes. Yes, thank you for your talk. So I think one of the main application areas would be to use this in edge computing, right, with uh, constrained hardware. Yeah. So that's something I tried two years ago with an Arduino Nano. Um, I used uh, TensorFlow and TensorFlow Lite to reduce it. Uh, it was mainly quantization. Accuracy loss was minimal. Um, what has happened in the past two years? I, I didn't follow up, to be honest. So uh, what has improved? Is there, is there anything new? Um, what is AI Minify doing differently than, than for example, the old uh, TensorFlow Lite okay. quantization? So the what we found is that because we also ran into the problem of we wanted to quantize and prune our own uh, models for uh, Tinyfy, uh, and what we found is that if you look online, uh, yeah, there are a lot of tools you can use to to reduce your uh, the size and the, and to increase the speed of your neural network, uh, but everything is quite complicated. So you need like yeah probably a few days to really read up on okay what's to use and uh, how does everything work and what does it do to my network. Um, and what we wanted is something that you can just say, okay, uh, put in your network into this part of the code and then it detects everything automatically and it just makes the correct choices for you. Um, so that's kind of the, the edge that we have with AI Minify on, on other uh, libraries. Um, and concerning what, what happened in the last few years, so obviously because AI is going in the hyperspeed, so also a lot is happening in the, the, the compression world. Um, I think in terms of quantization, the, the most interesting thing is that for, um, especially for large language models, so like ChatGPT and uh, Llama, um, they are now doing 4-bit quantization, even 2-bit quantization. So in some way, I understand some of it, but not all. Um, they quantize to only 2 bits and still the, the network is working. So you can see that if you go from 32 bits to 2 bits, that's a huge size uh, reduction, um, yeah, which is really interesting. And uh, I'm really curious to see uh, how small they can go. Mm. Well, I'm really curious uh, to try out your solution. So I think I'll, I'll try to fire up the old uh, environment. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Okay. Thank you. Next Maybe you can provide a little bit more information, actually, how AI Minify works. So. Um, so you, you, you upload your model yes, so and the system 
Oh, the short version is you can forget all of what he's been telling. That's <laughs> it. Then we will do it for you. That's it. No, uh, when we started with the uh, Minify, we had Tinyfy in the background in our head, and with Tinyfy, you can just upload your image, we compress it, and give it back to you. Just throw it over the wall, and hey, good luck with it. So when we started to talking to people, we were like, okay, give us your model, and then we will compress it, and we'll give it back to you. And everybody was like, uh-uh, that's our secret source of the company. So that's not going to happen. And there were some exceptions, but most of them were like, you're not going to touch our model. Uh, so then we need to find a solution for that, and what we did is we now have an on-premise solution. So we will run on your infrastructure, we will run the, uh, the compression, mm -hmm. and also use the training data for that, so to make the accuracy uh, loss uh, minimal. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's where we are now with the solution. So if you want to try it, yes, please, please do, so we can use the feedback, uh, because every time we run it somewhere, we get some more new information, oh, yeah, yeah, this is not working, okay, we need an extra setting, and that will broaden our scope of what kind of models we can handle. So that's also very helpful for us. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the way we do it now is with an on-prem solution. On-prem solution, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I know tiny PNG, how it works. So basically, maybe just like it give information. When you upload your image, uh, then it tells you, okay, we compress it that much. So before downloading, you know what is, what is the new size. So in case of AI Minify, what kind of information you provide for, for the optimized model? Yeah, so uh, not much beforehand. So because okay. it's super dependent on our network, and we also um, haven't used it enough on on a lot of different neural networks to be yeah confident on what we estimate. Mm -hmm. um, for the quantization, it's easy because you just know okay, it saves fifty or seventy five percent. So usually the size reduction is something like that, but the the latency improvement that comes from the pruning, yeah, can uh, differ from. Uh, 10 times the speed increase to, to 2 times the speed increase. So, and for now it's still kind of hard to tell why sometimes the speed increase is a lot more than other times. So that's something that we're yeah, also currently <coughs> investigating. We just want to learn from, uh, yeah, the more models we compress, the, the better insights we get, obviously. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions? Yes? Yeah, have you guys tried um, doing compression on open source models like Prithvi or Presto or Clay? Uh, not on those, but we have on other open source models. So on the smaller computer vision models like uh, a VGG or uh, yeah, some other of those. Um, and yeah, on, on those it all works pretty well. So yeah, we used to have like a, a table where you can say like, okay, we have 75% size decrease for those models and uh, latency improvement of like yeah, three to four times. Um, so that, that all works pretty well. I think the, the, yeah, the problem for us is that usually when people use a network like that, they also tweak it a little bit, they add extra layers, they yeah, do something with it to make it working for, for their own environment. And, Sometimes these custom layers, yeah, our algorithm doesn't know how to handle it or yeah, tries to prune something that, that shouldn't be pruned. So whenever we get a new model, um, at least for now, yeah, we need to, to look at it and see like, okay, is there anything that we haven't seen before and how should we handle that? But yeah, yeah obviously we, uh, we tried on a lot of open source models to at least be sure that, uh, that we can handle those. Yeah, so um, I learned a lot, by the way, because I know a little bit about neural uh, <laughs> networks, not so much, so it's great. I was just thinking, so you guys are a commercial company, right? You want to sell this product to uh, yes. these guys. Here are not <laughs> I do, he doesn't want to, I do, but it's... Uh, we don't have any money. We that's fine, just that's fine. Reasons. I was just wondering, how, what's the interest of you? How, how are we interesting to you guys? That's just uh, something uh, I'm a bit searching for. Right? Yeah, so what, what would help us is if all of you will start using it and give us feedback on like, this is working, this is not working, this is great, this is very poor or whatever. So if we get more feedback, it will help us speed up the, the improvement of our product. So that's, um, and also with more results we have, and uh, hey, did you do some open source? And then the more we did, the more answers we have. For, so case studies from- Yeah, that would be great. That would be great, that would be great, yes. Yeah. Okay, sounds great. 
Actually, we have, we have courses also where, where we are teaching this kind of, I mean, not the optimization, but use of neural networks and maybe the, the, the exercises, the case studies of those courses could be also a nice opportunity for you. Yeah. Because then the students can learn how to optimize the things mm -hmm. and, and they see, see the impact because actually we have also a nice, uh, we, we have uh, Francesco there, we have a UAB center where they use uh, edge uh, systems a lot. Uh, in our computing platform, we have also a lot of edge systems that are so we have a nice uh, wide range of uh, equipment mm -hmm. and uh, uh, capable of run, running the model. So it might be interesting to see how, how they yes. are. From yeah. Yeah. Yes, could be really nice. Yeah. Any questions? So one thing that I want to ask, so um, you put uh, rightfully a lot of emphasis that uh, the hardware has an impact, so eventually the different hardware has different capabilities. So uh, what if uh, having different versions of the models uh, compressed with different, uh, let's say, uh, targeting different capabilities which the system can automatically uh, select? So this is that kind of... Yeah, so what we're trying to do is keep the, the number of uh, parameters that a user can uh, use as low as possible. So we don't, because we don't want to become one of those complicated things that, yeah, that you have to put a lot of parameters in and you don't really understand what you're doing. Um, but exactly, we want to um, put some easy stuff in there like, okay, what kind of CPU are you using? What kind of GPU? Um, just for the algorithm to be sure to optimize it in the correct way. So, and yeah, then it would also be possible to, um, so for some companies that we talked to, we already noticed that they, for example, run their neural networks on both CPUs and GPUs, depending on, on their customers. Um, so we want to make it able for them also to, to be able to uh, optimize their neural network in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. So they can run the multiple uh, different versions of their network at the same time on different hardware. Did you do any? Uh, yeah. yeah. I have a question about the teacher student model with the bird uh, stuff. Is it not more prone to overfitting or is that not the case? Uh, so that depends a bit on how good your teacher model is. So, um, yeah, this kind of. Um, what you hope is that your teacher model is already good enough that if you. So the student model just wants to. Um, impersonate the teacher model. Um, so yeah, you, you do overfit on your teacher model, but that's kind of what you, what you want to do. So you just want to make a smaller model that has outputs uh, similar to your teacher model. So if your teacher model yeah, has some errors in it, then probably your student model is also going to have those errors. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's not as much an improvement, it's just an improvement in, in size and speed. Uh, how does this uh, link to energy consumption? So eventually we can improve the, the, the speed performance, but uh, nowadays we also talk about significantly about energy consumption. Uh, so did you do any kind of studies to test the impact of compression on, on, on energy? Or will you be interested in doing something like that? I think we would be interested in that. Um, for now, yeah, the, 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 the obvious thing is that if your network uh, does inference two times faster or three times faster, then you just have less GPU hours to use, which is, uh, yeah, saves a lot of energy consumption. Mm -hmm. um, we are interested, and so we've been talking to people doing CPUs, and we explain what we're doing, and they say, yeah, yeah, then we will sell less hardware. Yeah, that's true but it's better for your end user, and the, but they were not interested at all. And then you ask, hey, hey, how about the sustainability on your website? Yeah, yeah, that's there. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it doesn't cost any money, then that's nice. And we see that in the GPU world, it's kindly different uh, because it's more um, uh, money intense. Eh? So they, it will cost more money to, to invest to get started. So they are more interested in compressing and also for the end users. So I think there's kind of a difference in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be their own interest, it could be sustainability, I'm not sure yet, but <laughs> that's, they are more open for this discussion than the CPU guys that we've been talking to at least. Okay. So there were some exceptions, of course, but most of them were like, yeah, yeah, yeah get out of here. Okay. 
Well, the times are changing, so partly... Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I think so too. So, so I think in, in five years from now, the CPU guys will also think, oh, we cannot do that anymore. So, I, it, yeah. so that's... Uh, but yeah, not yet. Yeah. But sometimes you focus on speed, that, that's correct, but actually uh, there are many, many, uh, many things where people accept uh, to have longer run times, but maybe uh, to have a smaller impact. Yes, correct. Uh, on the environment, for example. Yeah. So there are things, this is what we do with travel actually. So somebody, there are many people who prefer to take a train instead of yeah. taking a flight, which could be much more faster, shorter. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it, it, so people prefer to take a yes. longer option. Um, okay, great, good to know. Um, any other questions? Okay, in this case, thank you very much. So I think it was really a very nice uh, presentation, uh, all about the, the not, I would say the basics, but also uh, quite, quite informative about the compression. So uh, please feel free uh, to to contact. Yes. Uh, AI Minify. So um, uh, I think from research projects point of view, uh, I see a lot of potential. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but for, for our students also for their research work. So it could yeah. be really interesting. So probably uh, many of you will be working on, uh, on AI models. So we saw convolutional neural networks as an example, but I think uh, similar techniques could be applied for, mm -hmm. for, for, for yeah. others as well. So uh, uh, that could be a part of your thesis study and uh, maybe a chapter in your thesis, which would be, I think, quite, quite interesting. So, uh, please feel free to, to contact Yes, for sure. Who should get in touch with uh, You can get in touch through the website, through LinkedIn, through phone, whatever. <laughs> they are very easy to... WhatsApp, I don't know, <laughs> email. Uh, so they are based in Amersfoort, so it's, yes. not, so, uh, it's also a, a, a close. So, um, yeah, I think uh, easy to reach, I would, I would tell. Yes. Um, with this, thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much. For this. And, um, maybe one short uh, announcement. So we will the next picture date talk will be on twenty uh, fourth of April, right? Uh, and uh, there we will uh, we will have uh, um, uh, speakers from uh, Veka. Uh, so Veka is a, a, a platform. Uh, for distributed computing, where uh, they provide infrastructure which speeds up the computation uh, 10 times uh, with the 10 times energy uh, reduction also. So that could be something uh, that would, you might be interested in also to, to learn more. So uh, we will open registration soon. Please follow uh, our, our web portal for, for more information. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thank you.